Bakes, how are you, mate? Good, mate. Thanks for having me. Hey, you're, you're looking quite pipey at the moment. Yeah, I actually bought these tops, put them in the dryer today, and they, they shrunk a bit. Yeah, so I thought, oh, is that the, is that put... you've gone the roll on the sleeves well, to no, sort of get the delta that's actually, out? That's actually natural. They're from the uh, it's country road thing, and I bought them, and was, yeah. they're actually stuck there. Oh, so I'm not, I haven't deliberately done the roll up. So I was actually, I... I was pulling them down on the way here, thinking no. they've shrunk in the dryer. Should I get oh, I some bigger. of those? Do you reckon, or is it? I've got, a, I've got a spare one at home. I've got a, <laughs> I've got a medium, and it's too small. Mate, how are you going? Absolute honour to have you in today oh, um, well. it's a bit of nostalgic for me because uh, not that I, I, when did was your last season 2011 2011 so my first yeah. season was 2012 not that, that we would have played against each other at all but um, I was wondering if we you know, crossed paths at, no because you no. were playing more AFL I think oh. yeah. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure of your, yeah. your career but. no 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 I, um, no I don't think we had any crossovers but I was a big fan of you and I'm, I'm oh. not just saying that I, I know you think I say it to everyone <laughs> um, and I do say it to everyone but I genuinely mean this and um so to all your other guests, you didn't mean it? So, well, sorry, not, not all of them. Um, no, most of them. No, uh, all of them. But, um, mate, it's an honour to get you in and, and have Thanks. a chat and, and what you're doing now and what you've done and who you are and everything. I'm keen to unpack it today. So no it's going to be exciting. How are you? Going well. Feeling good. Busy? Feeling busy, busy. Feeling fit. Um, yeah, I think fitter than what I was when I was actually playing AFL. So feeling good and, um, yeah, enjoying life at the moment. Why is there, why is there a, a sudden like resurgence of, of fitness come? Because you actually, like, in all seriousness, you do look extremely oh, fit. And you, stop I follow you on <laughs> um, Instagram and it's very rare to actually see you in a T-shirt, to, like, today. There's normally a lot of sort of Top rig off. shots. Like, <laughs> Don't around. say that. <laughs> Uh, that was a, some hot days there. Yeah. That was some hot days there. But um, yeah, it was been through some times, which we'll probably talk about now. But um, yeah, sort of it urged me back into the fitness route, which mm. sort of took my mind off a few things and rolled rolled on with it. So yeah, now f- feeling good. Yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? Like I know uh, for myself this year, I've, and people will be fucking sick of me talking about it, but just the alignment and the... Um, the sort of connectedness of like my mental and physical well-being like alignment together is it's not yeah uh it's not a um it's not something you can just throw out there it really is connected and how you can yeah, you know work that sweat like i actually sort of visualize when i'm running you're breathing in fresh air and exhaling bad air out and you like when that's you're sweating one. i always think about sweating like that's all like negative energy coming toxins. out of my body do you like not, that? That's not bad. I'll, yeah. I remember that. I yeah. remember these things. And even yeah. when I'm sort of like um, heavy breathing, which is quite often with running, I always think the more I can keep breathing in, the more I'm breathing out, like just yeah. all the shit. No, that's a good analogy. Because I think uh, I heard someone on Instagram saying there's a correlation between doing something hard physically and getting over things mentally. So yeah. you know, um, a couple of years ago, I lost my good mate Warney and you know, I went in a dark dark hole for maybe over over a year. Did want to leave home, lock myself, lock myself uh in my, on my couch inside, and um, yeah, it just took a, a mate giving me a tap, saying, mate, let's go for a run. Um, and I was, at the time, I'd had a hip replacement, and you know, thinking I'm never going to run again, and sort of took a bit of a support from a mate, and then sort of looking back on a few things that had happened in the past, losing my father, mm. you know, I, I had about a three-year bender when that, when that happened, and it was really looking back on what helped me through that was support, being surrounded by good people, positive people, um, and doing something hard physically. So back then when I lost dad, it was doing a tough, tough mud. It was a 24 hour race in uh, Las Vegas, which is a day night event. And mm. I just switched something on in my brain after sort of three, you know, three or four years, um, not doing much physically after finishing footy, it sort of snapped something on and on in my brain and it sort of rolled on into my you know, general life. Yeah, it's so good, mate. And I, I love what you said before about um, getting moving again and all those bits and pieces. But it's funny before when I was referring to like, knowing you know of you and not knowing you personally but there's obviously a perception of you of the way that you played footy which was just hard nose just you know grit which is you know funnily and uncanny enough the name of your your new business but yeah. it was just a guy that puts his head over the footy does anything for his mates that bloke that you want to go to war with but you know i think the modernness of a world and something that we know now is happening changing through um, the stigma of mental health you just think oh someone like this would never experience being upset because they're too fucking yeah. tough like yeah. they're not they're not scared of anything but for you to put your hand up and like nah fuck you know like lost my old man lost my best mate i went through a really fucking shit time yeah was that something that you know you've got a lot of feedback about since, since yeah 100 percent. and just hearing that everyone's got a got a story so mm. i got invited to speak at a, um, a kitchen which was a lot of homeless people my first talk was 
uh, it was only about 20 people. You know, I cried on stage, but just sharing the story. This was after Warney. Just sharing the story made me feel good and got so many positive messages, you know, talking about other people, you know, their depression. I've inspired them to go for a run or a walk the next day or to mm. reach out to a friend. Um, I think my story, when I lost Dad, I didn't want to say that I was struggling, but I was, you know, on the drugs every weekend, sitting in the you know, in my backyard with randoms on a, on a Monday was, you know, not, not rare. And my sister and I both went through a pretty dark time back then. Mm. And we probably didn't know it as much, but, you know, we were struggling. But, you know, I didn't want to say, you know, put my hand up. So when, when I sort of lost uh, Warney, it was more, she, what, what did I do after a year? Um, it, was, it was New Year's that I was w- with his son, Jackson. First mm. New Year's I hadn't spent with Shane for, you know, over a decade. So it was just a realisation that, you know, what am I doing? I, you know, getting on the sleeping tablets, getting up some days and taking sleep tablets, wanting to go back to bed um, and just losing passion for life, really. And you know, hanging out with Jackson that New Year's, he was doing, you know, he was off the drink and he was doing everything right and in, being an inspiration. I was sort of thinking, you know, if Shane was looking down on me at the moment, you know, he'd be ashamed with the way I was living life. He'd want me to be having fun, playing golf, yeah. travelling, having fun, you know, playing poker, um, the things that we love to do. So, you know, I got back from that trip and... Um, Turned to switch on, asked for support from a mate. My friend Matty Ferguson came around, went for a run, and that sort of ignited a spark. So uh, turned into a uh, doing a half Ironman. So we ran, I think, 10K the first day, and then the next day I booked in for a half Ironman. He thought I was joking. So it was more shoot first, aim later kind of a guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, yeah, that led into you know, completing that and then booking in for a, a full Ironman um, in December in Bustleton, and, and we completed that. And it's just... It's led to me sort of being op- open about, you know, being struggling, putting the hand up. It's okay to ask for help if you're, you know, in a, in a bad place. So it's, and it's led me here talking to you, which has um, been great. So, um, yeah, the journey's been a bit of a whirlwind, but I've enjoyed it. Mate, I'm honoured to have you in, in all seriousness. It's, um, it's, it's you know, I, I really, really appreciate your openness and, and what you were saying before, and I'd love to chat about that a little bit more. You're talking about, because that period that you mentioned about, um, you know, losing your dad, which is, traumatic in any sense at all like losing yep. a, a loved one um but then that spiral of like you go into probably just chasing another feeling to escape yourself and you yep. know you live probably for the weekend just to just to get by like unfortunately and the world we live in at the moment i don't know i i think we can dance around the subjects a lot when we talk about um the, the society and things that do go on like there is a lot of shit out there that people can get sort of into these downward spirals that happen how hard was that for you to break out of that that cycle of you know turning that two-year bender into like breaking it was it just something that became a habit and was easy to sort of you know live like that yeah i think it was um as i mentioned the tough matter but before that sort of losing football it sort yeah. of happened in a bit of a progression so 2011 you know rossi Lyon halfway through the season said you know at the end of the year we're not going with you and then the following year, you know, I was playing at uh, Craigieburn, you know, offence to Craigieburn. We hadn't won a game, so I went from being ar- surrounded by just passionate animals that wanted to win a pr- flag together to not winning a game. You know, we lived for the weekends, like as you said. Yeah. And then halfway through that season, you know, losing my, losing my dad. So I lost footy, lost passion, and then lost my father, who you know, I loved um, massively, obviously. And... Yeah, sort of to sort of sit with him, see him take his last breath. Um, I just lost a bit of you know, joy for life, playing footy, which I wasn't really enjoying. Um, thinking you're enjoying the weekends, but looking back, you were miserable. Um, and in very dark. I remember one one morning, so I look back now and laugh, but I woke up one morning on the couch and I, I, I'd wet the couch and I'm thinking, shit, I better go back to bed and you know, take the couch, put cushions outside and mm. go back to bed and I'd wet the bed. That's why I was on the couch. So I was in a bad way. So yeah. you know, it was drugs and sleeping tablets and it took me um, you know, years and it was slow. And I think you know, the Tough Mudder was something that snapped my brain. Yeah. I can get over I can get over hard things um, and doing a lot of sort of reading on grief and loss um, lately, you can't really feel deep grief if you haven't felt deep love so it's sort of a you know dark and light kind of a thing which is um, I'm not a spiritual person but you know you've lucky enough to love someone that much you you feel the loss Um, so yeah it took me years to get over that and then obviously with my life got so exciting being one of Warney's best mates you know we'd had three trips planned the year that he passed away um, and I was in in a sort of position my life's the most exciting it's been in you know, in years, and then it was just the you know the rug pulled out from underneath me and um, all everyone, and it was just a you know, gutting and those dark feelings came back for a while. And 
sort of snapped out of a lot quicker than I did you know, when, when Dad passed. But mm. um, I'm just sort of remembering you know, what got me out of that was you know, getting support for some friends and family, loved ones, and, and doing something hard. That was yeah. the things. I love your message about doing something hard. and um, I really appreciate it. I can feel the emotion and I'm you know, getting goosebumps myself and what you've, what you've been through. And I'm, I, I think for why it's so important is what you've learned through sort of sharing your story is a lot of people, um, you know, we can say a lot of people, everyone has a story, right? And that's not to take away from anyone's story, but by sharing it, we can find resent like that resilience in each other and you actually feel a bit more not alone when you can experience that other people have been through similar things. Yeah. That period, um, before we sort of maybe move on to, uh, you know, getting through that that grief and the, chat, the conversation with Jackson Warren, I'd love to, if you're okay with just chatting about um, warning your friendship with him and yeah. what um you know your favorite things about him were and for someone that you know is great mates with him is someone that all of us had fucking posters on the, I, don't, I fucking hate cricket but i loved him <laughs> i didn't like, like cricket i didn't, I, like cricket I didn't even watch it like i knew he could spin the ball but i just loved him for who he was and as a person yeah. but was he that infectious in in real life like how did he make you feel what were his best uh qualities that sort of um, you you love and, and miss about him? Yeah, I think we, we were probably friends for twenty years. I met him in the Saints rooms. I think I played a good game, and I might have done an article about poker in the in the paper or something. And he goes, "Bakes, come around for a game of poker," and that's how we how we met with our love of poker. Um, and his home games are just famous because we we always tried to bad beat Warney. He'd get he would get filthy angry when he got beat. He was so competitive in everything. Tennis. I played him in tennis one day, and he gave me a two game head start, and I ended up beating him. I was you know it was six four or whatever. And he goes, go, let's play again. I didn't play him again ever. Yeah. That was, I just said, oh, mate, and I just held it over. And he just hated the fact that he'd get beaten. But um, obviously when you walk in a room with him, like everyone's looking at you. So it makes you sort of feel a bit you know, taller walking in a room. Um, and just the fun, you know, I took up golf to play golf with him. So I, thought, I don't really like you know, the, the sport. But I, and then I started to get uh, addicted to my golf. So we started to have, you know, playing that. But um yeah, I went on a family trip. We you know, went up with him and him and Jackson. Stayed on a you know, beach house for a, for a month playing poker. It's just a just a dream life, and mm. um, just a, such an amazing man to see it. But he works so hard behind the scenes and his care and all his his charities, which he cared deeply about. Um, so there's a lot of people, a lot of things that people didn't see you know, yeah. behind the scenes. It wasn't just the yeah, the fun and, and the larrikin side. He was um, very deep. Uh, deep human when it comes to charity and looking after kids and stuff obviously um the tremendous person but a very funny person as well i can imagine there's very a lot of funny. stories maybe some not for the podcast but <laughs> have you got a favorite sort of shane Warne story that you can uh, you know, one that comes to mind the first time you'd love to just yeah it wasn't long before we passed i think here we were at the casino and he uh he cracked the shits because i think one of the um what do you call them? The people helping out with the chips. They didn't know who he was, and they just said, "Please wait over here." And he sat down with his chips, and then he ended up cracking it and throwing his chips and take my effing chips. And he stormed, he stormed out because the person you know, wasn't seating him at the table, which was pre pretty funny. But um, yeah, just his uh, disdain for the dealer. Uh, if it went next to his number twenty three, you know, it was and our numbers were together ten and twenty three, yeah. so we were always you know, back each other's numbers on the roulette table and. Uh, he thought the rule that person was against them if it went on the next, if it went beside us. But um, yeah, I'd have to think of some other funny stories that mm. I, could, I could tell him here. But no, too. for yeah. sure, for sure, <laughs> I can imagine. Um, it's incredible as well what uh, what Jackson and the family are doing with the um, foundation with the heart checks as well. I've seen at yep. the uh, Shame Worn Legacy, Shame Worn Legacy at yep. the um, Her they did it at MCG and also at Gather Round. Yep. We're actually trying to get them to our. Um, we're in touch with Jackson. I think the crew. We're getting them to our clubby sports breakfast to oh, do the, the tests. Yep. Um, for the early detection, which I think they did, I saw on the news they did like nine thousand in a yeah, day or something. Yeah, did heaps, yeah, heaps. Which is um, no, it's been amazing just to see Jackson sort of you know, take the reins and be yeah, so strong for job. his yeah for his family and his sisters. It's been amazing, and he speaks so fluently. He's just like he's had media training. Like Warney would never stuff up anything when he was in front of the mic, and I think that's something that's he's handed down to Jackson. He's yeah. um, you know, such a good people person, and he's he's got a heart of gold. And that, yeah, I think the Shane Warne legacy is doing some great things. I've actually seen um. I am a big fan of SAS. I love that show. Same. And I watched uh, Jackson on that. And to see, uh, this sounds super, super weird, but to see like the person he's grown from, from everything obviously in his life, but like yep. from that person that started that show to then how he ended and what he's doing now. Because I actually think he did a podcast with Ant Middleton as yes. well on his show yeah, that I saw a bit of. And even like you could see how proud like Ant Middleton was of him and what he's been through and obviously how he's 
grown up over the past little bit. Like, it's fucking impressive. Yeah, it's massive. And I think to impress someone like Ant, yeah. who's an absolute psycho. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so I think him and Jackson have been to a few events together. And, obviously, so if he's got respect from Ant Middleton, the ultimate yeah. um, in mindset and uh, toughness, I think, uh, yeah, obviously, it's a show of Jackson's character and uh, how far he's come. What would you? What were you like as uh, an 18-year-old kid? Uh, I was a bit of a troublemaker. Yeah, a really? Of, <laughs> <laughs> coming from Colac, I think I was in a street fight every every second weekend in Colac, and then I got to the AFL and got. You know, when I'd go back, I'd had a few street fights that Rossi found out about, and but he sort of swept them under the rug because he sort of liked the way I played footy. Yeah. Um, but is that yeah, real? Was, though? Like, is that because for me growing up, like I wish I was cool, but like that just <laughs> fucking. I reckon I got punched in the face once. <laughs> I just oh, really? wasn't, yeah, like, oh, I just got, I, it wasn't, I couldn't really say it was a fight because I just got punched. Like, I didn't throw one. <laughs> you just got punched. What yeah. were you doing? Annoying people? Well, I, I don't remember. <laughs> okay. I just think this guy came and punched me in the back of the head. I was like, at least fucking when I'm facing you. But um, punch ons like, was that a, like actually a thing like that went on growing up? Well, yeah, I yeah. don't know why. Me and my brother got caught up and we had a sort of a brother fight against other brothers. So every weekend you'd get out and you'd, you'd bump, in, bump into them. And um, yeah, so I think I had like 20 or something <laughs> fights. Uh, before I uh, got into the AFL, so when I got in, I thought fighting was you know, just a normal thing. Um, it teaches you. I, I don't want to go out and encourage people to fight. No, definitely but not. I think there's a part that it does really teach you. Oh, am I telling grit? <laughs> no, does, you can't. We can't say. I don't want people to go. No, out and I was fight, silly and you know, I was yeah. silly and stupid back okay. back in the day. So yeah, but it's, I mean, it's also made you who you are. Yeah, true. I'm trying to find a positive <laughs> in this, positive, but I just but, uh, I don't want to like promote fighting, but I also no. understand like what. You know, I look at my old man as well and what, you know, he's a tough, tough guy. And I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but I think there is. Well, I think going through adversity. Maybe it's a risk-taking in adversity. Yeah, yeah. I think in my grit talks that I've been doing, going through adversity, it makes it makes you tougher. Yeah. So usually it's, you're doing, you do hard things. If you're really passionate about something, you can push yourself or you've been through a lot of hard things on your journey. That makes you tough. So yeah. I'm glad I was, you know, a rough, rough nut. I, I wouldn't have made the AFL any other way because... As I mentioned earlier, I, didn't, I don't have many skills in the in the football department, but I could chase, I could tackle, I could not give up. Yeah, and they're the attributes I think the, the coaches loved. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's evident watching you play, and I think as you said earlier, like all those things about hard things get you through hard things, as we'll, we'll continue to talk about today. Yep. You're saying um you didn't have any skills. Now they're your words, not mine. I think that a skill <laughs> in its fact is is grit. It's it's those things about not giving up. Like it's yeah. one of the biggest skills that you can you can really have. And to be honest, it's probably the one that. Not a lot, of, not a lot of many people have, but it can be trained. Was it always something that come natural to you? And and when you got into AFL, you got drafted. You got drafted the same year as Lenny Hayes. Yeah. Um, getting to the Saints, I think it's like any young kid that goes to a, an elite system. You you go away. Well, I went away from sometimes the things that make you good. Did you ever forget and be like, no, I want to be a, like Lenny Hayes? But you're like, no, you know what? Come back to what makes me fucking good. I'm I'm tough. I love doing the hard things and that or was it always a part of like sort of your uh, forte? I think it was just sort of part of me. I, I talk about in my uh, presentations that I run now about you know, my childhood growing up with an older brother who never let me win. So yep. I was relentless. I wanted to be a basketballer. So he was beating me up my own sport every, every night and I was like, I don't know, I just developed an absolute hatred for getting beaten. Um, and then when I sort of moved to footy in under 17s, I just had a sort of natural grunt and I had a growth spurt. I was always a real short kid growing up, mm. so I was always getting banged around. And, and when I sort of grew, grew into my body and went and changed to football, I think I played a year in under 17s, and then we played a, a year in the scenes with my brother. And people said I wouldn't make the Falcons, and I, got, I talked to the Falcons um, boss, and he said I was the last one picked. They actually had me out of the squad, and they had one more practice match. They, they got me down to fill out the numbers. and. Mm had something like 15 or 16 tackles and the coach said, I want this kid in because he's, he's given effort. So I think without the effort side of things, you know, I wouldn't have definitely made it. I wasn't getting a game in the, in the Falcons all year. And I think it was two or three weeks before the finals, I got the coach said, can you stop someone? It was a young kid averaging like 40 touches a, a game. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I'll give you the game. We'll give you the game ball if you can beat this kid. So my eyes lit up, I couldn't afford a ball. So I was like, I'm going to go outside, so went out and give that kid hell. I won't name names. but Who um, was it? <laughs> Steve, Steve Hazelman, his name okay. was. Um, you, but you we, nearly killed him. Because he's down. <laughs> went out <laughs> corkies. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I get, gave him hell and got, I got the game ball and that sort of um, 
birthed my tagging career and then tagged in the finals and I think the St Kilda recruiter John Beveridge was there probably to watch someone else that day. I had an undercut and a ponytail and he said, who is this little little wanker getting the ball bloody all the time? And um, so I was getting towed around and it just kept falling in my hands that day in the grand final. It was the Murray Bush Rangers and every time I got the ball, I just handballed it. So I was too scared to kick because I, I was a crap kick um, and yeah, got scraped into the AFL but pick 27 was like pretty high pick yeah I'd, I was hung over on the couch and I, I had a few <laughs> had a few mates out there and I was I just heard an eruption my brother's come in jumped on me and elbowed me in the head I was like looked up and I saw my name on the screen Stephen Baker I, but I had no idea where I was going and it was just a, a magic moment I thought I was dreaming Tim Watson was on the phone he was my first coach and I thought he was joking um, hung up on Tim Watson um, and I spoke to him last week about that on SEN but um yeah, it was just a, a whirlwind. So I had no aspirations of playing in the AFL. I was just you know, going out and having a crack. Um, and when I got there, I thought, I'll, you know, I'll last my two years. I'll get a, get some get some money. I think well, fifty grand. I think this is unbelievable. Mm. I was working at a timber mill before uh, football, so nine to five at a timber mill. So yeah, it all happened very fast, and it wasn't until sort of a couple of years in when I got a few senior games. I became good mates, best mates with Lenny Hayes. So my professionalism professionalism was down bottom and his was up the top mm. and he he dragged me up i dragged him down a little bit got him in a uh, street fight at love machine one weekend <laughs> got him head butted by a bouncer <laughs> split him open um <laughs> and he didn't even get in trouble and i got i got called in the office and he called in lenny was, you can't get up right yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was like everyone loves lenny i was like shit um but yeah being good mates with lenny was just um i think it saved my saved my career got my pro- professionalism to a level where you know take my footy a bit more seriously get more out of the body so yeah it was um a, a long journey getting in the afl and then yeah it was years until i sort of thought geez i might be good enough to actually play play here was there like a period you're saying before about um with lenny hayes and it helps having a mate that can help you through and i'm sure you speak very humbly of him he's a beautiful person we had him on the pod um last year as well we had nick rear on the pod and the way they both speak of you as well is is incredible first picked in in any team and because of the attributes we'll speak about shortly but with that was there a period in those early years where it could have gone either way like do you think that because from my understanding i would have thought you would have rocked up and just been like no this is fucking mine straight away i'll go and do what i need to do to play but did it take you a while to sort of work no, it out? I, was, I was i was literally going there thinking i'm just going to play in the reserves for two years and i'll yeah. be and i'll be done uh, i missed my first ever training session with this tim, is- tim watson at, <clears throat> so i uh Got caught up with Barry Barry Hall and Austin Jones. Um, they took the young guy out you know, the night before, the Friday night. So the night before your first training session? Yeah, training was meant to be at 9, but it was, um, no, 7am. 7, 7 and I woke up at 9 and I am just and I was wet. I'm thinking, what the hell? I'm thinking I've wet the bed, bring back childhood trauma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was walking around the house, I was in the nude. I was like, what is it? And I had you know, someone scream at me and I said, sorry, I don't know where I am. I was at Barry Hall's house and... Uh, apparently I got a bucket of water thrown on me and I got to the club at like 11 because I had to work out where I was and so I was four hours late to my first ever training session and there was just this big guy called Fish standing there just going come with me young fella and I just went through like two or three hours of grueling gut work and just exercises spewing in the gym spewing in the bin and I was staying with the host family it was literally 200 meters from the ground <clears throat> so I was like how did you miss training at 200 meters from the ground so it was a, I remember and he said, don't talk to Tim before Monday. He doesn't want to see your face, doesn't want to hear from you. So I had the whole weekend like, oh, shit, I'm going to get the ass before I even started. Um, get to training. He doesn't look at me all training. And then at the end, I'm still sitting there with my ponytail and undercut and sitting there. He still hasn't um, locked eyes with me. And he said, uh, Barry and Ozzy, if you do that again, you, you're playing in the twos this year and effing Baker, you'll be on the first train back to effing Colac. And get an effing haircut. So I was like, just sitting there like, you know, so next day I shaved my head, yeah. <laughs> sitting in the front row, like ready, ready to take notes. But uh, so it was a tough start to the AFL, but looking back, I didn't care about footy. I didn't want to be a, a star. I just, I was, I was probably just happy to be there and mm. get my two years under the belt and say I played AFL or in the reserves and that was it. So That's such a great story. Did you lag on them or did they find out someone took you out? Uh, well, Tim found out that Barry and Ozzy took me out. So yeah. at the end, he, he actually said, you guys are playing the reserves this year. But um, yeah, well, I think Tim and, Tim and I had a bit of a laugh about that That's know, great. months later. So it, it, was, it happens more regularly than you'd, you'd think as well. I think like there was so many boys that um, in my fit, like not, not probably the same story, but just like literally sleeping. The first, yeah, the first through. session. Yeah, the first <laughs> session always. Um, what was your welcome to AFL? What was your first game? Do you remember? 
Think about uh, it. I played in a couple in my first year. I think the seniors got smashed by you know, 100 and something points, and I'd had a heap of tackles in the twos. Mm. And Alistair Clarkson was assistant coach at the time. That's And he loved the, you know, he goes, put bakes in because, you know, the seniors that uh, played that terrible. So, but I didn't get on the, didn't really get on the ground. At, but Buddha Hocking was my first main game, it was my second season. Uh, the, the seniors were going terrible, so I got a, got another chance. And Buddha Hocking from Geelong, he just came up and just, bang, give me a big open palm in the nose. My eyes were watering. I couldn't see for like five minutes. That was like a welcome to the AFL, but then I snagged two goals on him. So it was like, <laughs> 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 thanks for the welcome. <laughs> and that was sort of, uh, yeah, my in with uh, tagging. So um, then I sort of held a regular spot. So that was sort of towards the end of the second season. So when did Ross uh, come in to, to play? When was his first uh, season? So there's Tom, I can't remember what year. Oh, I'll Grant Thomas, obviously, as well. Yeah, yeah. Grant Tom. Oh, we had Malcolm Blight. Um, he just played golf every yep. week, and yeah. he, he just took the piss a bit. I don't speak too kindly. Oh, I'd like, hate it, Blighty. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> he was like he liked the players that pulled their socks up, and you know the ones that. So Lenny bought. and Rui. Yeah, he liked all, liked yeah. all those. The Lukey yeah. balls. He liked he loved yeah. Lukey ball because he was such a you know, f- finessey player. Um, but he hated me. I remember he. he made an example of me he got me out in front of the group and he goes Bakes do you know how to effing do a bork he goes every time you get the ball you just run into someone you just try and bulldoze the people and he goes bork me and he's like sort of belittled me in front of the group yeah. a little bit and I was like just wanted to go up and I had the instinct to get and punch him mm. um, yeah, so never liked Blighty and you know, I think one preseason he didn't let us touch the balls and before Christmas so it was all running and so I was just um, yeah, then Grant Thomas, and then uh, yeah, Rossi. Rossi came in, but I loved um, yeah, I loved both co- uh, coaches, Grant and Rossi. Mm. Grant's a cool dude. Like I, I um, I'm actually really good mates with um, Jack Nunes. Who? Oh did, yeah. You, you would have missed on Jack. Uh, maybe. Yeah, a missed. Year. Yeah, missed just a, a year. But um, he's uh, he's married to uh, Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. No, yeah. I played golf with Tomo month a couple of months there ago. You go, you go the national. He got, yeah. Well, up. No, where were we? Um, Pico, no, is it, Pico. Isn't Pico, no. Pico's out in Frankston Way. No, Sorrento. Sorrento, yeah, we're in the National. National, is that the yeah. National? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's yeah. a beautiful course out And there. we had him by a couple of strokes, and then he just putted one in for about five metres to, to draw it at the end. I just thought, yeah, shit, but anyway, good yeah, player. Very good player. Yeah, beautiful course up good there player, too. Good player, good player. Love to get up there. Um, what's your, your favourite sort of memory of playing with Ross? Obviously, there were some incredible times there. We talk about, um, uh, obviously, the finals, and like yeah. I remember those years of you boys just absolutely oh, my favorite game was it the game was it the stevie J game when you were both win hadn't lost going into um, um was yeah, that when we kept on battling like, each other that yeah, the, yeah 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 because like stevie and i played on each other in the 2009 grand final yep. and i think yeah the next game you it, hadn't have we have we both not lost? I didn't we know, know that. There's a, there was a great there was a game. They're probably talking about three different games here, but there was a St Kilda um, Geelong game where you both were hadn't lost. Oh yeah, I think it was 17 wins in a row, and you came to it might have been because there was a lot of tension. That it was game. fucking. I think crazy. I got reported four times. Yes, in one game. So it was. I think I remember there being a lot of tension, but um, yeah, the build up was great because it was. I think Stevie wanted to get me back because I sort of got the better of him in the grand final, even though they won. He yeah, had the last laugh. Um, and yeah, word got around that we were, we were holding a bit of a grudge, and then it was just on from the first bounce, like it was a whack. He, I still reckon he broke his hand on my head. He, he reckons it was from a clip or whatever, but I saw him rubbing it after whacking me in the head, and then I was whacking his, whacking his injured hand all game, and it was, yeah. The story at the end was, um, you know, Stevie went up to the their club doctor at three quarter time, and he's he had a broken hand, and he yeah. said, "How how long am I out for?" And he said, oh, it's probably four or five weeks. I think Stevie's told this story. And he goes, I'm going to go and get that little bacon. <laughs> and he came out and I was doing all my little tricks, stabbing on his feet. And I was yeah. behind him and ripping his arm, underarm hairs out. Um, oh, fuck, that would hurt. Yeah, so it was one of, my nasty, one of my nastier moves, except for sharpening my stops. That probably trumped it. But um, <laughs> he gave me the best elbow I think I've ever got. And you know, eight stitches and my eye didn't uh, open for about, for about a week. So, But I remember saying, I'll look after you at the tribunal. Don't worry, mate. I've got, I've got you back. And I ended up getting... 12 weeks with nine early plea and he only got three or something for a vicious elbow yeah, that's... I was like just tapping him on the hand and feel the lupper cuts nothing <laughs> nothing stupid you look after him it's like yeah you look after him it's like there's vision of him elbowing you in the face and you're like no I don't think it actually connected like it was alright I think it's hard to sort of shake that one that was for him yeah. like you can't really get out of it but it was an incredible yeah. time I loved loved watching that shit that's why I think that you speak to Lenny and Rui and um you know the guys we were lucky enough to talk to on the pod, but 
that's why you love playing with teammates like yourself. Like you weren't yeah. going out there just to do it. You're doing it because there's a role for the team. And yeah. um, as much as you know, you're probably having fun while you're doing it. The anxiety and stuff that comes with actually no, a role think, like that, it's you, fucked. I don't like, you're having fun. I think I'd, I'd have sleepless nights. And yeah, I played one game. I didn't sleep one wink. I just remember I was up. I get eczema and I, you know, when I'm a bit nervous, yeah. I was up and I was having a cold bath at three a.m. and just because of the. You know, if your teammate beats you, I mean, your, if your opponent beats you, you, you could lose the game. So it was like, it felt like a, a lot of pressure. So I felt very sort of anxious before games and stressed, and um, you know, if I, I don't want to let the team down, kind of, kind of a thing. So it was a bit of a bit of a pressure roll. Fucking oath! Like I know it's you know I, I didn't really ever do any tagging, but knowing you, you got, got tagged. Uh, yeah, when I was playing forward pocket, I had this fight <laughs> running around in the all day. They used to say it was a back pocket, but I think he was a tagger. Um, <laughs> what were some of those roles? that you know did keep you up like who were times where there was a big pressure on you was it like going into grand finals was it more just even other games that were um big throughout the year was there yeah. ever a matchup that you really got put on you to, to do something for it i remember playing on like um, ablett jr chris judd um, cousins i played on he just ran me to death one day i remember the second time going, oh no he's gonna i think i ran like 18 kilometers in a game we had one of those tracker things yeah. and um, but every player was different. Like Juddy was just so fast around stoppages, so I had to play them different. But um, I got nervous before all of them, but they're probably the ones that st- um, stand out. Stevie J, obviously, in the grand final 2009, I think. Uh, you always have the bad bad thoughts. Shit, he's going to kick the winning goal on me and I'm going to let the team down. So I remember I had a nightmare about that leading into the grand final. and um, Yeah, so the, obviously the the ones that stand in my head are the, the, the top players. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, the grand final. So I remember just panicking that I didn't want my player to have that winning goal. Who was your favourite teammate? Lenny Hayes. Lenny. Yeah, I just I remember I met him. It was I think we uh, it was at the footy club before our first training session, and he walked in with his entourage. He'd won the, I think it was called the Morish Medal, the VFL or whatever, but and the, the best and fairest for the under 18s league. I can't remember what it was called. Um, and he had the entourage, his mum, dad, his family, had about 10 people. And I'm just sitting there with another guy talking with my little undercut. And Lenny's come up and he said, hi, hey, shake your hand. I thought, <laughs> he walked off and I was like, what a wanker. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking he was a nerd. And, but then I just, the first pracky match and he just went in like a, went in like a bull. And I just thought, shit. So it was the ultimate sort of respect straight away. Um, just from seeing what he what he done, and then you sort of realise he's actually a good good person. Never says a bad word about anyone behind their back. So it's um, I think that's why everyone loves Lenny. Mm. So yeah, big respect. He gets uncomfortable with that tag as well, doesn't he? It just shows yeah. how good of a bloke. Very he humble is. man. Yeah. Like if you give him a compliment, he's oh, nah, nah, he yeah. always brushes. Because if off, I so. had, a, I love like Dylan or I love Bakes T-shirt. Like I'd fucking <laughs> love that. Like I'd yeah, we'll get around. We'll get around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get, it doesn't really work though when you when you nah. promote him yourself. I think. I think they did it for Lenny. I think they all he had that. Hated I love it, Lenny. He hated it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. They pretended to. Um, towards um, the end of of your career as well, you said before about um, actually before we talk about the end of the career, Ross Lyon. What you see him back um, coaching now and and doing his thing? Like, what's your thoughts on him coming back to the game? And two, what was he he like for you personally? And that thing of like respect versus relationship with people. Like, was it as strong? Um, do you think that it was like you know a tough move? Obviously, telling you that you're not going to be getting a contract next year, but was it done with like respect? And were you happy with? No, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent respect. I think he blamed um, someone else for it. He blamed the, the new footy manager, but. Um, yeah, Ross was just, if you give him 100% effort, he was he yeah. was on your side. And if you don't, your stripes a bit. But um, it, it was a bit daunting sort of walking in after a loss and he'd have the witch's hats marked out on the on the footy oval, like inside on, on a fake footy oval. And I was like, oh, shit, we've got question time. You know, we're, so he, had, he was very methodical, had a you know, position for everything, which probably most coaches do. But, um, yeah, it was just, he, he demanded respect and you know, mm. he got he got it. So yeah, we, still, we still catch up for it beer occasionally and, and get get along so oh, he seems like the funniest dude ever he's like, yeah. very dry sense of humor yeah but he's very funny i love it it's so good um now i'm pumped to see what the saints actually do this year it's um, have you got is it machito owens in the 10 owens yeah. yeah owens in the 10 it's good bad, similar right? players yeah toughness Skill he's maybe skill might he might have me a little just bit just a little bit I think just just a tiny <laughs> he bit might have me a little bit just a, hey. <laughs> it's a slow starter but through um uh we talk about like the transition period earlier it was a it was a bit of an up and down period for yourself like off field how was that like reflecting now um and you talk about you know with with grit and everything you're doing 
Do you think that it was players were set up for success uh, in your day of like transitioning out of the game? Like, did you think it would be? Um, what were your thoughts on it, and how did you think it like prevailed actually um, in real life? Yeah, I think I, I started to think about. It. I reckon you do get everything put in front of you, yeah. but. I think it's sort of up for the individual. You've got to take it. Like we'll give you business courses and opportunities to do things, but when you're playing footy, you're just not thinking it's going to ever end. Mm. Um, so for me, I was panicking. I remember when I laughed because I, I was playing some of the best footy that I'd played in years, and I didn't know it, but when Ross told me at like around 11, I was actually coming second in the best and fairest. Yeah. Look, and so I wasn't expecting it at all, and I laughed when Ross told me, and he goes, no, nah, we're serious, we're getting rid of you. And it was like... My heart sunk. First thought was, you know, mum and dad, they're going to be shattered because they loved going to the footy. Um, but then, oh, shit, I've just bought my you know, just bought my first house. Um, what am I going to do for, for work and things? So it sort of did cause me to panic a little bit, but it was no fault of the AFL. They, I think they give as much opportunity then as, as, they, as they do now. Um, but I think it's up for the individual to take it more seriously because I think the average footy player lasts three or four years um, and you're lucky to play longer than that. So... Yeah, I think I'd, I'd urge players to sort of start looking at life after football, and I was a bit, I was a bit lost um, you know, when I get the ass, and when I got the ass, and then um, obviously when I lost dad, sort of yeah. spiraled down. If I had had something that I'd get out of bed for, whether it be a business or something that you, you're waking up with a bit of passion for, um, could have changed things. Yeah, it's super hard to like just say, oh, I'm going to find a passion. Like it doesn't really work like that, does it? You have to unfortunately no. sort of fucking work it out, and it doesn't sort of hit you between the eyes. So yeah. It is one of those things, and I'm always wary of talking to anyone, not just sports people, about um, what's next. But it is a bit more relevant in sport because there is an end date on it, yeah. um, and there is an expiry at some point. So, being able to use what you can and the networks that are around are obviously super important. Yeah. Um, speaking of, so uh, obviously before we touched on the devastating loss of your old man, and and um, and then spiraling into the loss of Shane as well, which is a fucking shit time. How else did you help? Um, yourself in that period like what were other things that maybe you weren't doing as well versus things that you weren't were you ended up doing to get back to your best yeah so i think in the last year i've sort of been concentrating on the, the fitness side of things yeah um, i think that's something that's helped me and having a having a routine so i have a morning routine um grit which i've which my talks about i do you know, gratitude resilience inspiration and team so yeah. you know, surrounding yourself with good people you know being grateful um, being inspired about something, um, what, what that is, and then resilience relates to morning routine, doing something every day that you don't want to do, mm. whether it's a, a water before a coffee, just little things. You don't have to do something stupid. Um, if, some, if you do something you don't like every day, it builds up resilience. Because um, I think doing my talks, I've just realised that everyone's got a story, as we said before. Mm. And if you sort of prepare yourself for those bad times that are definitely going to come, you, everyone's going to lose a loved one, everyone's going to lose their job, break get their heart broken something's around the corner and so i think building sort of a mental toughness now gets you prepared for those things where i definitely wasn't sort of prepared for the first time losing dad and you know went down the other route you know alcohol drugs um but sort of now i know what works for me like i went off i went to adelaide and you know got drunk one night and i had you know, four days where i just didn't want to get off the couch so yesterday I went stuffing on booking in a training session today. So I teamed up with a few a few friends today. Went to the gym at seven a.m. and now I'm feeling now I'm feeling good. So it just takes little changes or something that's hard doing you know, something that you don't want to do, and your mindset just change. It can change very quickly. Mm. Um, and also if you see someone else that's struggling, like my mate Maddie did for me, um, he's he gave me a nudge and pushed me. So we're going for a run. We were just having a drink and I said, I can't run. I was, you know, sob story. I was all caught up in sort of misery and mm. you know, I lost my best mate and I've had the hip replacement. I've had two operations in the last three months. And But he goes, I don't care. He goes, I'm, I'm rocking up at your doorstep tomorrow and we're going for a run, a 2K run, which, you know, it started pissing rain. We went, we went 10K. So the little nudge, sometimes you've got to nudge other people in the right direction. Um, and for me, like accepting help was a huge thing. You know, I, s I said, let's catch up for a coffee and a chat and ex you know, wanted some advice. And that was his advice. We're going for a run. Mm. Um, and then it sort of led to, yeah, the progression and it's led me here talking today and sort of, um, yeah, been loving it. How thankful are you for, for him and what he's done for that, yeah, for that conversation? Because it's, it's fucking, it's a tough thing for him to do as well, to say that. Because the easy, not the easy thing, but the more comfortable thing is to just let it go and check in and send the message but 
to yeah. then follow up the next day and be like, mate, get the fuck up, we're going for a run. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, and it was just a little thing. He just said, no, I'm, I'm turning up. Mm. And I didn't think he would turn up because I said, no. I said, oh, I'm not going to go for a run. But he just turned up on the doorstep. So it was, you know, I didn't sort of look back at when losing the old man and going through, you know, years of sort of um, not feeling the greatest. Um, then looking back at the tough mother. I don't know if that was the exact point, but just looking back, oh, that's what I did there. I had some support from friends, and but I remember sort of feeling bad back then and you know, not not asking for help and you know, pretending you're having a good time every weekend. Um, but yeah, a nudge is pretty powerful. And I know just doing these talks recently that it doesn't take much to inspire someone. I'll tell my story and then I get messages saying, oh, I've gone for a run. I've been suffering depression. I've had friends um, say to me that they've been thinking about suicide you know, in the last year just for, just, and me speaking about it has helped them speak up about it so um I and i hate the public speaking i told you before this i'll get nervous as hell but that sort of gets me out of bed now i like feeling nervous again mm. that sort of reminds me of football sort of nervous about something this after this i'll be like ah it's, yeah. it's, it's done and um yeah so it's good feeling nervous again i suppose mate it's so true like how good is that feeling of and this is something that when i um finished playing sport i'd go you know what i cannot wait to never feel that anxious again of like game day and going into a fucking meeting worried about something then you miss it <laughs> you realize you're, you actually need it like yeah. you need it to go forward otherwise if you're not uncomfortable you're not growing like it's just crazy and i know for certain like when i'm feeling shittest it's like if i'm just stagnant and i'm yep. just doing the same stuff and not challenging myself doing new things even if it's like having that tough conversation having the water before the coffee taking the fucking stairs instead of the other like just yeah, little things little like things. that you can just continue to sort of keep going yeah um it's it's amazing like we're, we're probably not built to feel safe like if you really go back to like you know the um the caveman mentality like we're not meant to be just chilling out like we're meant to have people it's meant to fear for our life yeah and i can i have enough fear for everyone believe me it's in there um but yeah i think there's a there's a real point of i found this year too because even with the podcast and stuff we do like i don't take for granted how lucky i am to do this but i got to the point where i was like because i had a similar period of my life where i got to a um a point where i was just feeling really shit and i was like i haven't actually done anything for a long time like i used to hate pre-season camps well i thought i did then i was like fucking miss that stuff went on one um went on a trip with some mates and i was talking about it and i'm talking about it again now and i was like yeah but i haven't done anything since like i need to do another one of those things and do yeah. something again to just get that sort of energy and do it so i've actually yeah. got another one booked um hopefully in september with our old high performance um, manager, David David Butterfin. He has yep. a business called um, Resilience Builders. Do I invite? Well, you might have to sue him. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 he um, he's incredible, but similar yeah. similar stuff. Like we just go and get out of our comfort zones. Like I fucking hate caving. I went caving, um, mm. you know, cold water, fucking hiking up mountains. Had no. Yeah. You know what the hardest thing was for me those three days? What? No reception. <laughs> out of really? all the things, I was just just being unco- like not having my phone on was nearly the hardest. Yeah. Like, how, that's sad to say. No, you do get but it was caught tough. in the screen a bit these yeah. days. Especially when you're feeling down, you sort of scroll. You just scroll. It's just, easy to just, uh, it's just easy to just keep yeah, going. Um, so with Grit and your, and your talks, um, obviously been doing a heap of stuff and incredible stuff. Who's your sort of ideal people you love speaking to? Is it sort of catering for, for all parties? Yeah, well, as I sort of mentioned, it was, you know, I started at a, a community kitchen and then I, then I thought, oh, footy clubs is going to be my only sort of outlet, you know, because being an ex-footy player. But then I started getting invites. I did one up for a power station. I um, mean, in WA, I did four talks. and then, mm. But recently I've done some talks for, for kids for schools, which, which I love. So I've sort of I've made another talk for Build Grid Academy, which is more, you know, failure is okay, building resilience, effort beats talent. So it's more of a, a kids presentation, which I enjoy. I love, love working with kids. Um, but then the footy clubs are fun. So I, I love having a mixture, to be yeah. honest. I love doing a, a footy club, having a laugh. Um, did my old footy club, South Colac, you know, la- last week, and that was great. So I did a bit of the serious grit stuff, but then, you know, some funny stories, some funny photos of my brother and had a bit of a laugh at, yeah. laugh at the end. So, you know, the, the, my story's a bit of a mix of, you know, growing up, some funny stories and you know, even funny stories with footy. So it's not all serious and stuff, but I, I try and get the message across at the end with um as you said, I was you know, one, seen as one of the tougher guys at footy, and it's like, but it's okay to speak up, and it's yeah. actually tough to speak up. And I heard just this week that you know, there's nine suicides a day and seven are men. So, and I know that I've inspired a few other people to to speak up. And um, but in doing the talks, I think everyone's got a story and everyone's strong. It's not just obviously the the athletes. Um, you know, people working up in a 
in a mine or a power company. Um, you know, everyone seemed to have, have their own story. So, yeah, to answer your question, everyone, everyone. Love it, mate. No, it's, it definitely doesn't discriminate. You're doing a, a bloody fantastic job. And, Thanks, and, and even just... Um, you haven't got me on the cold showers yet. That's one thing I just can't be <laughs> fucked with, to be completely honest. I, I do want to build grit, <laughs> but just not that that grit. Like, that's not I went psycho like, for a while. I was doing, like, full cold. My mum's got the coldest shower. She's, like, on Your mum's funny as fuck. She, <laughs> like, throws wood at she, you. She actually shit. got a million views the other day saying that she hated me. That's, yeah, that yeah, was, yeah. She got, um, and, and then we got, we, yeah, Archie's reached out because she was, uh, the thing was about Archie's. Um, and mum got a free pair of thongs, and now she won't do a little, another follow-up video. <laughs> I was pissed off with that, mum. So, mum, if you're listening which you're not uh <laughs> i don't think she is oh, um, yeah, but that's great but um we'll put in all the um all the link in the show notes for for grit and yourself yep. and if anyone wants to contact i'm sure there there'll be a heap of people that want to get you out and tell your story mate they'll know there's a lot more especially with the footy clubs that you can probably say there that you can't say on yeah on the so there's a few more funny stories there, yeah but, um, yeah yeah definitely. buildgrit.com.au buildgrit.com.au yep. we'll um we'll have that in the link in the show notes legends, for everyone to access legends. mate and when we're out there too but um last one what's next just uh building grit Building grit. Um, I have my, Maddie, my mate, who we did the bustle to nine man with. Um, he goes. What is, is Maddie a, pl- a former player? Or just a yeah, he played yeah. At the, played at the Saints. He's a Saints years. Well, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he was at the Saints, um, but now he's just an animal. He's done. Um, he did a marathon, a, an ultra marathon. Yeah. He's done a heap of Ironman. So we're looking at Bustleton again, but um, I'm enjoying the sort of the journey of build, you know, build grit at the moment. Um, but I think I'm going to have to do the bustle again and try and beat my time. Fuck. I said to Maddie, can I do it with no training just to sort of have a crack at it and really test the body? And he just laughed at me. So yeah. now I want to do it just to... Well, not that I'm building grit on this and it's more just a you lack You want to of... join in? No, I don't. I'm, <laughs> that was I'm, pretty, no, blunt. That was I'm pretty doing, blunt, No, I'm doing the um, <laughs> the Gold Coast Marathon. Oh, oh But perfect. I haven't started any training for that yet. I've, when, I've done a marathon When's before. that? I might join in with you. That's uh, July... July 6th? Oh, that's, that's... 7th, July 7th. Oh, so shit, that's not too far away. Yeah, it's pretty close. Um, okay. Yeah, we're doing that. We, I've done a Melbourne marathon before, and the Gold Coast is apparently a little bit flatter, so I'm hoping they'll be able to get through. But, hey, it's going to be... Fun. I'm going to have to build some grit to, um, <laughs> to get it You'll done. you to come to one of my talks, mate. I will. Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be locking it in. Um, Bakes, genuinely appreciate it today, Thanks mate. And um, congratulations on everything you're doing, brother. It's, uh, it's genuinely incredible and incredible message for a lot of people to hear. Uh, across Australia and the rest of, of wherever else you're going to get to. So I really appreciate it, John. Thanks for having me. Thanks, bro.